We're going to move on to our first panel discussion around the incredibly important topic of trust. So uh, trust is a strange thing. I, I, I think we don't really have a universally accepted academic definition of trust, but we all know when we see a breach of trust. Um, I, uh, I was thinking a lot about um, something that uh, Pyle said last night about how um, it's like a coconut tree. Trust takes years and years to grow, but how quickly the coconut falls um, is, is how quickly trust can be lost um, in, uh, in, in a breach. In financial services in particular, trust is a, is a critical element. It can help providers differentiate themselves from others, and it's critical for markets to function. It's, it's truly foundational. I've been thinking a lot about the data from the 2022 uh, Edelman Trust Barometer, where we saw the continued increase of trust in business. Um, businesses are um, the most trusted institutions in people's lives at, at 60 uh, percentage points. But the financial services sector in particular fell during the same period and was one of the few sectors to fall during the same period. What do we do about this? Um, I think it's central to this discussion around responsible finance. Um, the trust that providers will deliver products and services that meet the needs of low-income customers. Governments will create an environment that supports and protects consumers. And in this first panel, we will dig into why consumer trust is declining and what might be some approaches to rebuilding it. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, Bob Anibale, is a senior fellow at the University of London, SOAS, and a fellow advisory uh, council member on uh, CFI's advisory council. Um, his focus has been for decades on social and inclusive finance, social entrepreneurship, and the important topic of financial justice. Um, Bob has a long career as the founder and global director of Cities Inclusive Finance um, from 2005 to 2020, which mobilized over $3.8 billion in financing across 36 countries, developing new products and partnerships to serve the financial needs of underserved communities. As a leader of city community development focused on financial inclusion, immigrant integration, affordable housing, and racial justice in the US. He's been honored as a champion of change by the Obama administration for his work supporting immigrant integration and citizenship in the US, and by Euromoney as a global impact banking champion. And Bob, someone I learn a lot from every time I hear him speak on these topics. So welcome, Bob, and the panelists to talk about uh, trust with us. You want to climb on up? <laughs> I'll <laughs> climb. I know people are, are a bit chilly here. It's a bit chilly. We're going to try to ramp up the heat <clears throat> and maybe soon need a coffee. Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce this, this session and um, Thank you for the introduction. But let me play another role that I did for many, many years as a banker, too. And in a way, <clears throat> play the role of consumer advocate. Um, we do have somebody here from, from Consumer International. But we're mostly <clears throat> thinking about the provision of and excitement about you know, the expansion of services. I would remind people, though, if you're in India 10 or 15 years ago, we would be doing a microfinance conference, if that was the case, talking about inclusion. And we would really be measuring things by scale and you know, replication and outreach. And everybody, we were all very excited. And then we had a crisis. And it was, became a crisis of trust, not just for consumers, but in how institutions were being treated. And that crisis should be in the back of our minds a little bit when we feel we can wait to bring consumer rights, consumer protection, um, regulation to keep up with what we're introducing uh, digitally. 
because digital is, is in many ways an even greater expansion ex uh, to what we tried to do, which was still very cash-based 15 years ago. But look, I wanted to just bring up quickly, when you all saw the Findex data from 2021, <coughs> that one in four unbanked adults said they don't trust the financial system. If you go to the United States and you look at the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which insures all of depositors, their semi-annual report on the unbanked and underserved, the second largest reason why people uh, don't use formal financial services, and they tend to be new to them, particularly immigrants and certain other vulnerable communities, is because they don't trust the banks. The third reason is privacy. They fear their privacy. When we looked at adoption, and we look at the scale, we need to keep up with the idea of how are people experiencing financial services. Because we know trust. You know, once when that came up yesterday, Powell made it very clear. If we lose trust, it's an enormous setback, not just for that client, but it could be for the sector and for the public in general. Trust is a word used all the time. If you carry a dollar bill, the one thing it says is, in God we trust. And maybe beyond God, people's trust varies a great deal. And in the United States and elsewhere, we have to remember, trust has been challenged even recently. Of course, not long ago, we saw the lines in front of banks in the UK, Northern Rock. We saw the nationalization of banks, even in the UK. We recently saw Silicon Valley Bank and other banks in the UK, regional banks now, suffering from some loss of deposits, moving them, being moved into larger banks. <coughs> All of that is an issue of trust and how quickly it could be lost, even in an industry that has been for 100 years and is enormously regulated, like the UK or the US. So where we are working, which are countries where this is new, and we're looking at very rapid uh, adoption, we need to be very thoughtful about that, about the impact of fraud, consumer recourse, the need for it, and privacy. So with that, I'm going to quickly start by asking you to do one thing, which is a poll. It's, it's just, if you could, oh, there you go. I'll get out of your way because you'll need that. And we're going to look at what is the one factor that most influences trust. You can use one to three words. You know, what do you think is the one factor? Interesting. And I, I would think in many ways history, reliability, the experience people have had, customer experience is so important. That's something, looks like it's right in the center there. Great. And I'll ask each of our panelists to do the same thing. So we have five esteemed panelists, all of whom, just because of you know, time, I'm going to suggest you could see them in the brochure. There's their bios. And I'll just introduce them one as we introduce themselves very quickly. But I'm going to start by first talking to Paul Adams from IPA. And I've read some of your reports that you did in your research, the one on Uganda Consumer Protection Survey, which uh, for many of you will be a very interesting link to take a look at. I mean, you and IPA have extensive experience in the topic of community of consumer trust and consumer protection. The relationship between those trusts and protection and how that varies uh, is one of the things you have. You, embed in, a, in your survey, which the results kind of surprised me in many ways. But how do you see the role of providers versus regulators? And maybe give us just a quick snapshot of what your survey revealed in the case of your countable. But what's your one word? <laughs> ah, the one word is difficult. Um, there's so many things. I, I, you can have three, I think. Yeah, I mean, I like reliability here. I think the thing with trust is that like the coconut analogy, it's a repeated game, right? Like, it takes a long time um, uh, to build, and then a, a very uh, it can be very quick uh, to to lose. So, on the surveys, IPA has uh, four. Uh, we've run four different uh, surveys in different countries, looking at consumer protection risks uh, for DFS users, um, and in particular, the one in Uganda, we looked at the issue of trust, and so we're looking at what are the challenges that consumers face? What are the consumer protection risks? Things like fraud, things like overcharging, things like transparency, things like redress. And what we see is when consumers 
have faced one of these challenges, and roughly 90% of the consumers have faced mm -hmm. at least one challenge in the last 90 days, or possibly a year, I can't remember, then if they have faced that challenge, then their level of trust in either the, the FSP itself or in the agent that they're working, working with, working through, uh, reduces. And they're quite differentiated. So if the issue has been with the mobile money provider, let's say, then their trust in that provider goes down. If it's been with the agent, then the trust in the agent goes down. And so you know, the other thing to say here, the sort of additional thing that we look at beyond trust is what happens to usage. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, you know, Michael mentioned it earlier in his opening remarks, that we need to be really careful about usage and what happens afterwards. So after you have faced one of these challenges, we see that usage reduces, um, especially when that issue has not been resolved, right? So you've tried to address it, you've tried to seek redress. If it goes unresolved, what we found in Uganda was your 20% um, of uh, participants uh, reduce their usage. Something like just under 10% stop using that product, right? And so that's a big, um, that's the coconut falling on your head, right? Then you're, you're kind of back and you're, you're, not, um, you're not engaging in financial services. And there is a risk that we lose you from the system. And so to your, to your question, is this providers or is this um, regulators or policymakers? I think it's both, right? I think there's a role for providers in a competitive market to be competing with each other for consumers' trust, right? That has to be part of it. So it's all about reputation. But there's also a role for regulators in building a system that people trust. So if something goes wrong with one firm, that might be okay. I can go to another firm and it will be okay next time. But if that firm also uh, sort of screws me over, then you've got a problem with the system. And we're still, I think for all of you can give a sense to this, because I know the markets you look at, we're still thinking mostly of payments transactions, aren't we? You know, it's, we have payment and credit mm -hmm. in terms, and of course remittances, which you know, most experienced countries have a very long history in working through remittances, and by and large a good one overall, though expensive. So, but your, your survey, were they mostly people using payments, or were they people banking and... Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the market in Uganda was such that most of this is about um, uh, payment users. Um, a little bit on credit, so we also look at the challenge of, for example, uh, being refused a loan, or uh, potentially going into debt and having you know, an issue with repayment. So those are challenges we look at, but in general we see um, the usage of those products is, is much less, in Uganda at least. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and we'll be coming back to you. Uh, Ashley, GSMA, you know, we all know that you are the, the industry group, if you will, and you do a lot of research, but you represent an industry and in mobile. Um, you recently published the gender, uh, uh, gender report, you know, the gap, 223, which showed a worrying slowdown in adoption of mobile internet adoption by women in low and medium income countries. How much is this slowdown due to a loss of trust, do you think? What else could we attribute it to otherwise? Um, and where is this coming from? Do you feel that could address that? Is it regulators, providers? What is it that we should, how should be, your industry be responding? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, so certainly we have seen a slowdown in internet adoption. I think also in our latest State of the Industry report on mobile money, we published um, some data around the gender gap in mobile money account ownership, which I think is specific to the digital finance ecosystem. Um, Findex reported that the gender gap of mobile money ownership is 28%. In our consumer survey, we saw that this ranges widely across different markets, right? So um, as low as 2% in Kenya, for instance, which is fantastic, uh, but as high as looking at 85% in markets like Pakistan. So there's a lot of work to be done, and we need to look at markets you know, uniquely as, as their unique <coughs> context. Um, 
how trust plays into this, it's really hard to quantify, right? Um, we asked consumers across six countries about the barriers to mobile money account ownership. So we asked mobile phone owners who don't have a mobile money account owner uh, account, you know, about the, the various barriers and how acutely they, they related to them. Um, 21 to 40% uh, responded across Nigeria, India, Indonesia, and Bangladesh that trust and safety was a significant barrier for them to own an account. Um, and more women than men reported this in Nigeria and Indonesia, though in the other countries it was reversed. So we see this as a very pervasive issue across genders. It's not unique to women, it also affects men. However, with, you know, more than a decade of work accelerating women's digital financial inclusion, we know that any barrier is more acutely um, disproportionately difficult for women and, and we can confidently say that women have really high levels of mistrust for digital financial services. Um, so one of the solutions to building this trust that we've found and we've worked with operators and mobile money providers on is the agent. The agent is such a critical element in building the trust. They're the, the consumer facing point at which that user is engaging with a human around digital financial services. Um, and uh, women tend to prefer women agents. Um, we, we did a study in Bangladesh where we interviewed 4,000 women and 75% of them said they prefer engaging with a female agent, yet 99% of the agents are men. So you can see how that would be a very difficult uh, engagement for usage. So even if they have that mobile money account, they're more apt to use it less frequently because of having to engage with a male agent. Um, and just narrowing in on that, you mentioned privacy in your opening remarks, and we've seen this as one of, the, one of those elements of why uh, women prefer female agents is because with a mobile money account, in order to make an agent transaction, you ultimately have to reveal your personal phone number. This is a big issue for a lot of women. Um, you know, engaging with a man, uh, certain social contexts make that very difficult. It could also be just that you feel uncomfortable. It can be a stranger. It can also be someone who you know in your community. Um, and so one of the things that we've developed in our inclusive tech lab is a tokenization tool that would allow a user when engaging with an agent to make a transaction to create a unique identifier to then share with the agent to make the transaction. And this protects their privacy, it protects their phone number from revealing it to that agent. So whether it's a man or a, f a female, they can keep that privacy. Um, and we're just about to kick off some research in Nigeria and Senegal to actually look at this specific element of trust and agents and actually try to quantify how much of the problem can this tokenization tool solve. You know, we're working on um, increasing female agents, but at the same time, how does that privacy element of keeping their phone number uh, private actually support greater usage? I mean, that's, that's really an important observation, along with the idea of fraud. And I, I yeah. think once the, your number is out or available to people, we all know how much online fraud there is in any society at the moment. Um, but this, this is the one tool somebody has. And if your data uh, is mm. sold, or even sold for marketing purposes, yeah. because you may not have the privacy laws in, you know, in your jurisdiction, again, you start to become prone and exposed to something which previously you weren't because you controlled completely who had your phone number. Yep. That, that's an important observation. And I think when we get the next one with Harshi at Microsave, which I have to say, Microsave, when I first began a journey of looking at financial inclusion like 20 years ago, um, it was one of the organizations I first, in Nairobi, sat down with Graham Wright and watched one of your survey groups that you were doing with consumers. And you always were just looking at consumers very, very early on in your research. And we're gonna talk for a second about something I just love, that you, what you call your trust busters. But you know, the Vindex 2021 report, it did say 80 million adults made their first digital payment 
during the pandemic. So we had this huge onboarding in a way. And I think, you know, that was clear in the Indian presentation and by Queen Maxima. It enabled massively governments to make payments out. And I know Mexico has used these platforms, Brazil has used it to make government payments as well. But you're also starting your research to show there is there are things that are eroding confidence and trust and usage. And I, I love the way you call it. You said agents have a lot to do with this, which is interesting. It follows from our earlier discussion. So tell us about your observations and about these trust busters. Sure. So um, at Microsave, we've done extensive research on agents, as you mentioned, across different geographies. And some of the issues that have been persistent and common are around um, sometimes unavailability of agents at the last mile, uh, lack of liquidity, overcharging issues, um, breach of data protection and privacy, specifically at the agent outlets, because a lot of data is being collected at, at, at those points. But having said that, despite of all of these challenges being present, agents even today remain one of the most common and most accessible support source of information and support um, for the last mile, for the customers at the last mile. And uh, very recently, we conducted a research uh, in uh, a few geographies, including India, Kenya, and Bangladesh, and uh, with customers and agents. And around 82% of uh, the agents uh, accepted that they are the first source of information for customers in case they go through yeah. any, uh, they experience any fraud, financial fraud, as you mentioned, Bob. Um, or, or any other information that they need around the product or services that they are using, or even to seek grievance resolution, like despite being accessible grievance resolution mechanisms available everywhere, agents are the most common source of uh, support that customers resort to. So those are some of the challenges that are uh, present, and those are some of the challenges, uh, cha and this is one of the very strong channels that can be used to garner trust from customers. And cust as I said, cu customers usually reach out to agents for three, three things, as I highlighted. Fe uh, lack of information around products and services that they use, frauds and scams that they experience, and also to seek support around uh, grievance resolution. 62% of the customers we interviewed um, said that they have no idea what to do once they experience any kind of financial fraud. Now, this is important. They basically reach out to friends, their families, neighbors, and mostly to these agents to receive information. And that suggests that an agent body is not limited to just uh, facilitating transactions. They are doing so much. And this is something that providers need to be mindful of and to ensure that responsible finance and responsible financial practices can be uh, channeled through uh, them. Uh, I'd like to quote a few examples that I saw in one of the research that Microsave commissioned along with CGAP in Uganda. We saw that uh, the providers were conducting extensive training on responsible financial practices for agents, and some of them even installed video cameras at their outlets to ensure that the, that the debtors, fraudsters. There were practices around, we talk so much about grievance resolution, but we haven't seen any grievance resolution specifically designed for agents. So um, there was a call that there should be a grievance resolution support with specific turnaround time. Let's say any complaint that comes from, a, from an agent needs to be resolved within 48 hours or 72 hours. They need to be prioritized because they're not, only provide, they're not only helping themselves in terms of making money, but then they are providing support to the end numbers of customers. So those little nuances need to be taken care of. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's really interesting about the training of agents because some countries have got regulations yeah. that extend to the agents, yeah. but most don't. I mean, most get as far as the institution if they regulate them at all. And, and that came up this morning saying, which regulator regulates what kind of institution? But the agent is ultimately also where people reveal data, they reveal information because it's their only source of, of contact. And when you have, this is a, true of even older, you know, banked societies, the closing of branches has left elderly people, you know, new to banking, others 
without a point of contact. Absolutely. I have it with my neighbors sometimes. You know, you just want to go so far to find a bank branch for their, and then they don't have really the capacity to help you. Yeah. They'll always say you'd have to phone. And this is where an agent becomes that point, but how we embed them in the regulatory or the training or certification of some form uh, is, is something to be thought about. Yeah. And Microsoft, you've done great work over the years in all these areas. Thanks. Thank um, next, Wilfredo, you have a long history, both academic and also been a practice in Mexico, which, you know, is again, Mexico is a real middle income country, which has a very vibrant banking system, a very big banking system, a consolidated one at the moment with foreign banks that playing a big part. But it's also a country which has had payments um, through remittances for a very long time to, to the point that it's the, I believe it's usually the largest source of foreign currency for the country. More than oil, more than tourism could be the remittances coming in, similar to the Philippines and certain other countries. And um, So you've had, a, this is digital in its own way, but it's often been through an agent model, similarly, where people got their money. So your, your observations would be great. But also, could you tell us a bit about uh, Kondusev, where you serve, and about the work you've done around consumer protection? Okay, I, I would say trust is a social construction. So uh, we have the, we need to, to build those conditions. And talking about the government perspective, uh, government should build the, 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 the elements to, to uh, have that, that, that trust. And trust, trust for me means uh, to have clear expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and each country has a, its a context. It's very important for me to say that in Mexico in 1995, uh, uh, Mexico uh, suffered a very strong crisis, mm -hmm. what known as the effect of tequila. So uh, it was really, really difficult moment in my country. Uh, from night, night to morning, uh, mommy, families uh, lost their houses, and they couldn't uh, pay their, their debts, so the, the system crashed. I, I'm talking about um, more or less uh, 30 years ago, but that, uh, that wound uh, hasn't closed. So it's very difficult in that condition to, to uh, build uh, trust uh, conditions. And uh, I think the, the better way to get that is um, trying to take uh, financial education contents to the elementary school. Uh, but this topic is difficult but because uh, it, it, it doesn't like to, to, to politicians. You know, uh, every time you pull a change uh, in the education, it means that you're going to get a result perhaps 10 years, 15 years, mm -hmm. and uh, government, they need votes, and uh, their periods uh, ends every four or six years, as in my country. So uh, it, it's, it's difficult to, to, to put that. But right now, what we are trying to, 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 to do in Conducef is uh, since uh, this uh, current government began in, uh, uh, five years ago, we uh, are working with the educational ministry to uh, work for th those skills and contents in the elementary school. In Mexico, the elementary school system, uh, I'm talking about 25 million children. Uh, and I'm pleased to, to, to share, to, to, to tell now, to tell you that uh, that uh, project is, 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 is now a, a reality. Uh, perhaps we are talking that next year in the uh, public uh, books, educational books, mm -hmm. uh, those uh, financial educations are, are going to be there which means a huge uh, uh, reach uh, talking about this topic. We think that's the better way to trust, uh, to, to, to build trust since the, since, the, since the children. 
And has there been a re... And you say it was a long journey to rebuild trust since 1995, and that involved, at that time, primarily the banking system, I assume, right? You now have these new players. And in Mexico, also, you know, fintechs and others are developing quickly. It is regulation from a consumer perspective being extended to these new players as it has been to the banks, for example? Yes, um, uh, this government uh, is applying a very massive uh, social uh, policy, uh, social programs for the uh, old people, scholarships for the students, uh, um, single mothers, but for us, it's not a, a matter of a bankerized people. If you bankerize people and you don't give them uh, elements to make, uh, to take responsible uh, decisions, uh, and you don't uh, teach them how to um, handle that uh, uh, financial products, uh, then it's very probably that uh, they will get in, in, in problem. That, that's that's what, what we are trying to, to, to stop. So the main uh, focus now, uh, since the conduits have talking about uh, financial education, is to always uh, join those uh, people who are getting that uh, social benefits with a social education to because we are going to make sure that they are going to uh, uh, use uh, that benefits in the uh, better possible way. So imagine uh, there's a universal scholarship uh, for the uh, young people in Mexico who studied uh, middle school. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want them to use that credit to get a, a, a last generation mobile, we we what we what we want to to do is to um, know them, uh, give, give them elements to uh, handle that uh, benefit in the better possible way. Yeah, thank you, uh, Andrew Deep for Devar Research. Right, I guess you can take us back a bit to the Indian context as well. Um, again. I, you've looked into this and discussed it on your, your journeys you see in terms of building customers' trust and the experiences in this market, particularly, I guess, in India. Can you give us a snapshot of what your observations are following the others? Sure. Actually, before I begin, I just want to add ah, a word. Your word. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the word I will add is promise. It's not there. Uh, because you ask, you know, what is the factor that most influences trust? And I think it is the capacity to honor a promise yeah. that inspires trust. And in fact, money itself is a promise. This is why you have a theological inscription on the dollar bill. I mean, what could be more secular yeah. than a dollar bill? But you have a theological inscription on a dollar bill. And in fact, in Indian currency, we even say there's a, there's a signature of the Reserve Bank of India governor, and it says, I promise to pay the bearer. A yeah, sum of yeah. whatever. So, so I just wanted to add the word promise. Oh. Now, at Dwara, yeah, we've been thinking about trust for a long time now because you know we are um, we've been thinking about customer protection issues for almost ten years now, and um, and and you know recently we have started thinking about this um, issue of trust uh, in a somewhat new way, which is that you know. We have to recognize that there is also the problem of trust on the provider's side. And this is most clearly seen in the context of lending, because the provider has to trust the borrower. And the way the provider solves this problem of trust is to assume a posture of distrust and then to solve for trust by imposing conditions on the borrower. Mm -hmm. So what are the conditions? The conditions are the provider insists on evidence evidence of credit worthiness, credit history. The provider insists on commitment. In the microcredit space, commitment comes from uh, uh, participating in a joint liability group. Uh, the provider insists on uh, obligation, which is the letter of the debt contract itself. The provider insists on necessity, and necessity is provided by the credit market because uh, uh, poor customers 
If they default, they are liable to be excluded from the credit market altogether. And then the provider insists on validation, which is after the fact that the customer should repay the loan. So five conditions, um, uh, evidence, commitment, obligation, necessity, and validation. So if these are the five conditions that the, that the provider imposes on the customer in order to gauge, gauge the customer's uh, trustworthiness, can we invert the frame and insist that there are five conditions that are to be placed on financial service providers in order for them to be uh, 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 understood as being trustworthy. Now, when you invert the frame, there is an asymmetry because we are talking about poor customers. And poor customers are not consenting from a place of free will. Mm -hmm. Poor customers are consenting from a place of compulsion. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, a poor customer is unable to impose these conditions on the provider in the same way that a provider is able to impose these conditions on the customer. And that creates the room for third party actors like regulators or self-regulatory mm -hmm. organizations or independent actors or even investors to step in and solve the problem of trust. So in the Indian context, just recently, the RBI has published uh, recommendations. Last year, the RBI instituted a committee to, um, uh, to study customer service standards and to make recommendations on customer service standards. And uh, the committee has just published its recommendations. And we have looked at those recommendations through this lens. Mm -hmm. You know, that there are these five conditions. The customer is unable to impose these conditions on the provider uh, because the customer is acting from a place of com compulsion as much as uh, um, a free will. And, uh, and is the regulator uh, um, uh, aware about this customer trust issue mm -hmm. that needs to be solved? Now, interestingly, and I can go into more details on what precisely we understood these recommendations to be saying. But just as a high level uh, learning, we looked for the words customer trust in the recommendations and did not find them. Mm -hmm. So it would appear that the regulator in India at least has not fully grasped uh, the importance of uh, trust uh, and, mm -hmm. and the importance of um, of imposing uh, categories of conditions that the provider is required to satisfy. I think that's a very important observation. Um, and it's one which worries me when we, from our other experiences we've had, especially when we have very rapid ad you know, adoption of services of clients who um, don't really have much choice either. So they're not in a position to make a a commercial choice over who's going to ask me for what when they take a service, a financial service. Um, and that setback would be significant if it's just one bad player in a market. Um, before we, we, I don't think we'll have much time for Q&As for this session because I'm going to try to catch up on the other from the field. Um, but I did want to ask any of you, where's your biggest concern regarding trust? And, in, in what, all that we're doing, because we're very enthusiastic, all of us, obviously, about you know the, ex the expansion of financial services, new access, all the new mechanisms, some of the new players. We have concerns about the algorithms and otherwise, and that might only show itself, you know, more slowly as we get the data to do the analysis. But as we grow and and we want to ensure it's, it's it's responsible digital finance, what element that most worries you? Just as briefly as you can. That would help us later in the other panels to focus on ideas to address it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so my background is as a regulator and in, in consumer protection. So I, I, I love the enthusiasm in the room and from all the introductory speakers and from the Queen and, and everyone else around expanding access and usage. What I'd love to do as we do that is to make sure that we're thinking about consumer protection every step of the way. So that this is not a retrospective, okay, we've got everybody access, they're using it, but there are a whole bunch of problems. Let's make sure that we're building in those protections 
every step of the way along the way and be yep. proactive in that process. Andrew Deep. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, if I uh, situate myself in the recent report that got just published by the RBI, then, uh, you know, we looked at that report from, and we tried to categorize the recommendations into three buckets. One was, which of these recommendations advance the cause of customer trust? Which of these recommendations inadvertently weaken, of course, it has to be inadvertent, weaken the cause of customer trust? And which of these recommend, which are, which recommendations are absent, but could have, if they were included, advanced the cause of customer trust? So, thankfully, there are no recommendations in the second bucket. Uh, but we did find quite a few recommendations uh, that were absent, so to speak. And I think most of those had to do with conduct risk uh, obligations. Again, this falls under the obligations category. Uh, conduct risk obligations, and also uh, under the evidence gathering and validation conditions. So, uh, for instance, the RBI does not call, uh, include third-party apps or uh, social media platforms into account for, um, for validating or verifying the authenticity of actors who are participating on these platforms, for identifying and suppressing customer risks and customer harms before they arise. So I would say that those Perhaps. are some, yeah. Helpful. Please. Sure. <clears throat> so um, I'd like to highlight a few points. I think one of the game changes as like could be fostering innovation uh, for traditional financial uh, service providers. And I'd just like to give one example. In India, most of us would have seen Paytm, which is a mobile wallet provider in India. They came up with these so sound boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that basically acknowledges a transaction, provides a audio receipt of transaction to the customer. And you would see that everywhere in India, the micro and small vendors would have this sound systems installed. And that, that has been like a game changer. So I believe that such small innovations using mm -hmm. leveraging technology can, can go a long way in enabling trust. Other thing, uh, most of the countries, we, we started to speak about financial inclusion decades back and look where we are, like most countries have made tremendous progress. Um, but all of us have national financial inclusion strategy. I think similarly, we need to embed responsible financial practices in the national financial inclusion uh, strategy itself to make ambitious targets, to make sure that customer protection frameworks, guidelines, policies are embedded, and um, I think that would foster co co cooperation. Yeah. yeah. I arrived to this uh, wonderful country last Monday, and I went to shop something and uh, in the airport, I didn't buy rupee, I didn't exchange, so I, I didn't have money in my wallet. And I'm really uh, deeply impressed that in India, you don't need cash. Mm -hmm. and, um, I realize that in Mexico, we have a strong problem, because we Mexican people love cash. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have a, 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 a lot of work to, 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 to do uh, there. And then, uh, Talking about the, 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 the commission, the, the ombudsman, the, the financial ombudsman uh, where, I, where, where I work, uh, it's very important to give to the people that is complaining an effective uh, response. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that, is, that, that, is, uh, that, that is the main uh, element to, to build, uh, to build um, Trust is a matter of, of, of justice. Um, I think if you could um, build that uh, ambience, uh, the, 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 the possibilities to, to change uh, would be better. Thank you. Ashley? Yeah, my um, worry or concern, to sum it up really briefly, is fraud. So if we break all the barriers of getting people to adopt digital financial services and we get them to that point and then they have a fraudulent encounter or experience, it erodes all that trust. Um, Avena is a fraud management solutions company working with mobile money providers and they shared some data with me that uh, someone who has a fraudulent experience over digital financial services is 73% of them reduce their usage and 21% either cancel their account or let it go dormant. And 
the bigger concern here is the halo effect. So it's not even just that user, it's their family, it's their relatives and their friends that they tell that story to, that they share that experience with. And so I think getting ahead of fraud is, is a huge um, challenge, and particularly as social engineering is constantly evolving, it's not static. We can't solve it today. It's going to keep changing and keep adapting, and so it has to be a daily uh, a solution that we're working on. Well, look, I'm gonna thank everybody. I wanna get us back on the schedule, and our MC is there, and they're ready to take on. Uh, it, I hope we opened up, you know, in, for everyone, the, all the other sessions, that we keep thinking about this is, you know, trust is such an underlying, such a judgmental thing. You say it's, when I look at a dollar bill, I begin with, you know, where do people trust? And, and things is, I, in my banking experience, and you would always say the full faith and trust of the government, you know, in guaranteeing some debt. Well, in June, we almost lost that. In America, for example, for the debt ceiling, you could have defaulted. And the word trust is so important, like faith is built into language sometimes, even in the financial language. So we've got to live up to it. And, and mostly for those who, I think it's been raised, who are vulnerable and haven't been exposed to this sector before. Well, thank everybody here, and I'm going to turn this back to our MC. <laughs>